Uh, I would like to introduce to you a very special keynote speaker, Ward Cunningham. Ward is the director of the Committer Community for Development at Eclipse. I'm going to let him explain himself more and what he's doing there today. Uh, he's been there for a year. Uh, previously, he was with Microsoft. He spent a number of years as an independent consultant. And he's really best known for inventing Wiki, which was uh, developed to help the community develop code. He's been involved with object-oriented program languages and other things you can't say five times really fast without stumbling on it. So with that, I'd like to introduce Ward Cunningham. Well, thank you so much, Deborah. It's a pleasure to be here, and uh, I'm excited to uh, tell you about what I do, and uh, mostly I want to encourage you to do uh, more as it relates to uh, uh, open source and especially the uh, creative side of uh, open source. I think open source has with it the possibility of creating in a way that was closed off by, uh, you know, private or commercial uh, software. And uh, kind of the theme of what I want to talk about is how uh, you can bring that creativity back into what you do in a way that doesn't bring with it all the problems that we traditionally associate with software development. So uh, my focus is uh, ultimately on on Callisto. Callisto is a code name for a uh, project of projects inside of uh, the Eclipse Foundation. I'll say by way of explanation that uh, the Eclipse Foundation is an industry association that is devoted to producing vendor neutral frameworks and exemplary tools. The exemplary tools are supposed to show you how neat the frameworks are uh, it's most known for one particular tool, the Java development environment, and if you have anybody developing Java, they are probably using the Eclipse Java development environment because it is absolutely world class and very high uh, uh, penetration into the Java market. Uh, what's important though is that there's a lot more besides that tool. That tool is just an example of what can be built out of what is really uh, an excellent uh, uh, application framework. But again, what I want to talk about is what my role is uh, in terms of making sure that that body of code grows in a way that's useful not just today but uh, on into the future. So to do that, what I want to do is kind of go back. I want to, I want to look at three different uh, communities. Uh, and this is the, uh, the last of three that I'll look at. I'll go through these pretty quickly because what I want to do is I want to create a fourth community right here before your very eyes. And that's why we have these chairs set up here. Uh, you'll get to see that work in a few minutes. But first, let me, uh, let me uh, show you a couple, uh, couple other things. This is uh, the Eclipse download, uh, uh, one of several download sites. That's the... Uh, 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 the product of, of Callisto. Callisto, what we did is we took, you know, we have a bunch of projects that are all working within the framework of Eclipse. Mostly that means they, uh, they, they uh, uh, use a development process that we agree, all agree upon. It means that, uh, the, that all that's produced is uh, intell uh, intellectual property pure. There isn't anything in there that uh, a big company wouldn't mind using. But it's also licensed with an Eclipse public license, which means that anybody can use it. So it is a uh, recognized open source. What's important here is that we have some big companies that are releasing packages of Callisto components built into useful tools. And you can go to their websites. In fact, if you could read the fine print, it would tell you which components, which projects had been put together. What was important about our work was that we released that all on the same day, all those different components, so that people who were building on top of this, people, big companies that had, you know, real money at stake in the software industry, 
could trust this open source development process to deliver components and to build schedules based on it. I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit, but I'm trying to be motivating here. What I want to do is rewind the clock a little bit here to, uh, to another kind of community that is, uh, is a little smaller and is a little easier to understand, but I think it'll have ideas that'll carry forward. This is uh, what's uh, uh, become known as agile software development teams. And these are uh, small teams that are very focused on delivering software with business value. Now, there's uh, kind of two components of it represented by the two pictures. Uh, one is a, uh, is a planning process that repeats over and over and over again. In other words, you don't do uh, detailed planning because you know you're going to plan again, you know, in a week or two. So what you do is you care that the planning is good for the coming week. Uh, this happens to be a picture of, uh, 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 this is at a company that develops uh, uh, supply chain management software, and uh, most of those people standing up were the people who were product managers uh, for different lines of the software. Uh, in, in Agile, we call them the customers, even though they're not the ultimate customer, but they're the customer in that they're the people that the developers are trying to satisfy. Some people would call them the domain experts, or you know, but in this case, they're product managers, and it, and it turns out what was interesting is they all had ambition for the software that was being written, and that ambition wasn't always the same. In fact, in these weekly meetings, they would say, you know, put up on that whiteboard, here's the thing that I think are the next three most important things to work on, and you got five people doing that, and pretty soon you got 15 things on the whiteboard, and that's not going to get done in a week. But what happened is the developers who were working very closely with them in this agile style could estimate accurately how much they could get done. They would say, this is a big, this is a medium, this is a small thing. And uh, uh, when, they, when they had it up on the board, they could, uh, they could say, well, we have you know, three times the amount of work that we can get done. And then they'd start making cuts. Now, it wasn't any big deal to do a cut because you knew you had another chance next week. So it's this plan and then revise the plan and revise the plan. It's, uh, it's amazing how simple that makes things go. What's more important is you, after a while, you begin to develop a trust that if you don't get what you want this week, you'll get it next. More importantly is what's going on in the bottom part of the picture. We have a very similar uh, interactive style going among the developers. Uh, you know, a lot of people think this is really strange, but we ask developers to, uh, uh, to work together, shoulder to shoulder, work on the problems together. Mostly that's so that they, uh, they learn what's in each other's heads. It's also so that they make sure you're not working on something that you might need three weeks from now. What we do is we ask people to work only on what's been asked for this week, and that way uh, they uh, they're allowed to work as long as they need to get it right, but they don't work on something that isn't asked for. And that feeds back into a pattern where we say, we know how much we can get done, we have week after week of experience, and so when it comes to estimating, that estimating is for doing a good job of writing software. So we produce good software on whatever is important with a relationship of trust between the customers and the developers. Now this is pretty magical because that just doesn't sound like any software project that uh, uh, anybody has much experience with. Usually they're disasters and a lot of cheating and lying and uh, you know it's 90% done for month after month. And this is just the opposite. It's a change in responsibilities. It turns out it works very well. One way we made this work is we asked everybody to be in the same room. We asked everybody to work together. That sharing that's going on at the monitor is not so much about you know, saving space or keyboards. It's about understanding what's in each other's heads. And that understanding, the trust that builds up there is what makes the, the system work. Uh, I think we've got about, uh, you know, I don't know, 15% penetration in the software industry with this. But if you're a new project looking for a new methodology, we probably have 80, 90% penetration. 
That is, people starting new projects where they want to do it differently start looking at Agile in one form or another. And that's because it, uh, because it delivers. Now, I mention this partially to brag because I helped uh, get this stuff going. But I, I want to go back to this in a little bit. I want to line this up with the several other projects. One that, uh, that I get a lot more uh, name recognition for is uh, uh, developing this notion of a wiki. And wiki's a little different than what I described there with agile development, but it has uh, certain similarities. Uh, this is at the uh, first uh, Wikimania conference. This is the, the, you know, I developed the notion of a wiki to serve programming community, and then the encyclopedia geeks got a hold of it and have produced a fabulous encyclopedia that is uh, up to the minute with what's going on in the world and is written in a, in a pretty uh, marvelous style and it's written all by volunteers. So this is, uh, this is interesting. This is their first uh, uh, conference, which was uh, not this last summer, but the summer before in uh, Frankfurt. And one thing they did is they got the, uh, the encyclopedia leadership team up on the stage. This is sort of their, uh, well, what's interesting there is there wasn't any paid employees in the whole organization. It was all volunteer. And most of those people were volunteering at uh, keeping the servers running or uh, you know, arbitrating disputes when, when people started fighting. Uh, what, what's more important is that people in the courtyard on the right, uh, they, were the, uh, they were the encyclopedia geeks. These people, I got to talking to them and they all grew up reading the encyclopedia. They love the encyclopedia, they love the style, they love knowledge. And they, they would put, you know, many, 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 many hours into getting an article just right in the encyclopedia, just as a gift. Uh, it turns out that what's amazing is that they've managed to do this in uh, hundreds of languages, substantial encyclopedias in hundreds of languages. In other words, it's an idea that travels very well. So this is, I, I, I mentioned this, first of all, also there's this, this commitment to people you know, they, the, the people up on the stage are not really their bosses, but they're people who, you know, take a, a, a leadership role. And we have a bunch of volunteers who are uh, uh, working within the framework that they create. And that, that work is produced value that's, that's hard to imagine producing any other way. So, so here we see two different things where we're creating a lot of value by a kind of a, an innovative structure. Let me just ask, how many people have, uh, have read Wikipedia? Okay, so you, you know what is going on. I just had to check, you know, I, I assumed it was a lot. The, another thing that's going on here is that this community is global, whereas the last one I was talking about was all in one room. Big difference, around the world, all in one room, but it's the same dynamic of Contribution. What we learned from this is that uh, that the, the, the real expertise is distributed uh, pretty evenly around the world. Now, the people who are know nothings, they probably don't even bother to try to write for an encyclopedia. It just doesn't turn them on. But this does attract an, an awful lot of talent. So that brings me to uh, to to Callisto. This is, uh, this is my current work. I, I work with the Eclipse Foundation. Uh, this is uh, the teams that produced that work uh, in the last year. This came out in uh, the end of July. We always release in uh, July. And uh, the, uh, the upper picture is, is a group called the uh, Planning Council. Now, the founding documents for the Eclipse Foundation call out a number of different organizational uh, uh, entities, including a number of different councils that uh, uh, th with different kind of attendance depending upon a, a variety of factors. These people on the top uh, picture are the, uh, the experts that their respective companies or uh, uh, colleagues have put on that council for the purposes of deciding how things are going to be done uh, day by day or month by month through the year. Uh, they're responsible for coordinating the collaboration, and they took on the job of this project of projects, Callisto, and, uh, and managed it. 
Now, what's also interesting is that the bulk of the work was done, well, in some cases by some of those people, because some projects are small, and, and, and the same guy who decided what's going to be, be done ends up doing it. But there, the, the lower picture is a group of, of uh, these are the actual committers, the people who have uh, the uh, uh, responsibility for actually doing the work. And uh, we, uh, we gathered them together out here about a month ago to, uh, you know, they'd already actually succeeded, but we got them together to figure out what we want to do better next year. And uh, uh, they're, uh, they're, they're kind of the volunteers that, uh, that, that serve the needs of the, uh, the former. Now, it turns out that our founding documents describe how all this works. And, and by the way, if you're thinking of, you know, gosh, that'd be a great way to develop software. You know, there's a lot of people here from a lot of different places. And my model is that, uh, you know, you're going to leave here and you're going to go found a few foundations of your own and, you know, make great software that uh, really serves your needs. Uh, you're going to want to set up, you know, planning councils and stuff like that in the... Uh, the organizational documents are available on the eclipse.org website to tell you how we do it. But what I wanted to do is show you the real people who did it and talk a little bit about the stuff that's not in the documents. And in particular, uh, the fact that the councils were called together, people were nominated, and I think the first year or two of the uh, councils, they spent a lot of time trying to, you know, have discussions about what they were supposed to do. They didn't really find what they were supposed to do until we said, okay, let's ship all this software on the same day. And uh, they said, well, okay. And then all of a sudden somebody realized that that was going to be a lot of work. And we said, well, let's have a, let's have a schedule of conference calls. And uh, then all of a sudden on the conference calls, a lot of, well, what we'd call self-organization happened because there was a purpose. They were really focused on something. It was going to happen in June no matter what. And they really came together. Now, what's interesting here is we could do that over and over and over again, but instead what we did is we said, well, let's get the people who really did the work, because what we want to do is, just as the planning council, which, which was prescribed in the founding documents, exists, the actual community of people who did the work, we wanted them to feel like a community. We wanted them to know each other. Turns out they got together and they knew each other from emails, but they'd never seen each other. And so then we said, okay, well, what are we going to do next year? And they raised the bar themselves. They said, next year we're going to do it this way. And so they set these goals. Now, these goals, they knew that they existed because the planning council said, well, we ought to get the uh, committers together and let them figure out how to raise the bar next year. But the fact is, the one organization gave the other organization, uh, you know, street cred. You know, they exist to do something, and they knew what to do, and they're doing it. And this. This idea that, well, I guess I want to I want to say that that th th these are just ordinary uh, you know, ordinary geeks I'll call them, but they're but but they're they're also the geeks that tend to just I mean these are release engineers is what their titles are they're they're about getting the bits in the right place at the right time with the right build with the right compiler and it's really kind of I hate to use the phrase but it's you know it would sound like grunt work. You know, some, you know, the strategic planners in these companies might not even know they have them, but it turns out that they were the people who really mattered from the point of view of Callisto, and when we realized they were the people who mattered, we said, let's get that community together, and let's let that community become excellent. And as they get better year by year, what that's going to do is it's just going to be, you know, it's a, it's a delivery channel. They're, they're going to be so good at shipping software that people are going to just want to fill that, uh, fill that channel, and it's what's going to hold Eclipse together is going to be grown right out of this group. Now, I think it's important as we were doing a uh, retrospective on how things work. When one of the uh, one of the managers said, "Well, you know, I never thought this would work, but one thing that surprised me is that nobody lied. You know, there wasn't any, oh, we're going to make it probably kind of things." And we we're talking about why that was true, and someone said, "Well, because well, we can always go look at the code." You know, we can go look in the repository and see what you got checked in. And I'm not sure any of them did that, but, you know, the, the, th the thing is, the, the amount of honest conversation that, uh, that happened over a, a period of six months completing this project was amazing. And, and I think that that's something that happens when, oh, we use the phrase, 
uh, open, transparent, and permeable. The transparent part means we know what you're going to do and we can make plans based on it. And I think that's, uh, that, that's really important. Open is the open from open source. And the permeable means that if you find something that needs to be in that will have a path for you to contribute, no matter who you are. So that's, uh, that's uh, 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 Callisto. What I did is I made this, uh, made this chart to kind of compare those three different experiences. And, and what I'd like to do is I'd like to say that there is, uh, in our industry, the software industry, there's been a little confusion, I'll call it, that, that required a correction. And uh, uh, so for Agile, I think people misunderstood risk. You know, the, a lot of times people are afraid that a computer programming project is going to get out of line, so they want to make a plan and hold everybody to it. What we do is we make a plan and throw it away and make a new plan every week and that that correction uh, removes the barrier that the plan had become. The plan was actually a barrier to producing software and it was created to address risk and it did the exact opposite. If I compare Wiki, the, uh, the correction was the uh, distribution of knowledge. You know, the assumption was that uh, you know, the editors of Britannica know more than anybody else and it turns out that's not true. Not a one of them was down in New Orleans doing during the hurricane, but uh, Wikipedia had great New Orleans uh, uh, coverage. Uh, the uh, the barrier there was the privilege of being able, uh, being recognized as an expert. You know that uh, that anybody, even I, can write for Wikipedia. I don't even need a login. So that uh, uh, removing that barrier of privilege in the uh, uh, open source, I think the. Uh, the, the correction is recognizing that uh, by trying to preserve property, intellectual property, trying to, to say this property is so valuable, I'm going to hold it close to my chest, that we, actually, uh, that we actually destroy the property. The property becomes less useful. You know, it's less important that by giving stuff away, it actually begets more property. And it's, it's a strange thing, but uh, uh, one thing well, the barrier was a licensing, and the solution is a different kind of licensing, and that's the open source. Now, now, but because I want to talk about communities that do this work, let's talk about the teams. This is kind of interesting. The Agile, I already mentioned, we focused on the co-location, getting a bunch of people together, and we just assumed that if they were there day in and day out, they, their human ability to cooperate would lead to solutions, and we succeeded. We never would have done it without that. There's a, you know, computer people have this reputation of being loners that work late at night, and it turns out that, uh, well, if forced to, they will, but uh, no, they prefer to work together and have the respect of their peers. Uh, it turns out that uh, if we look at Agile, that team is actually serving somebody, and kind of understanding who they're serving helps understand what pulls them together. The, uh, the team uh, in that team room was serving the customers. The people on the lower part, when they were working hard, were serving those people up at the top, the people who said, this is what I think is most important this next week. And knowing that customer, that, ability, that desire to serve uh, can hold the team together. In the wiki, it's a little different. The wiki is a global operation. You know, I said the team is, is, is anybody paying attention. You know, if you happen to like reading Wikipedia, you're, uh, you're part of the team. Because when you read it and see something that's not right, you know, I just, I just fixed something two days ago and I'm trying to remember what it was. But it was trivial, but I just saw it and I said, well, that's not right. And I did a couple web searches and found what the right thing was and I put in a two-word fix. But it made me part of the team. The, the team is defined by paying, you know, by, by whoever's paying attention. Uh, that means not everybody, but the, you know, uh, uh, there are people who pay an awful lot of attention and they are really core to the team. And, and their, their, their dream really isn't to serve themselves, but uh, to serve other readers, you know. So anybody, you know, they know there's a lot of readers out there. The, uh, the, the open source is, uh, is, is a little different still. There's a tradition that uh, uh, started a number of years ago of, uh, of uh, uh, peer votes. The way you get to be a committer in an open source project is to uh, to make a few contributions, say, hey, I was reading your code and I found a mistake, here's a mistake, why don't you put it in? And after a while, 
the people who are putting the code in say, well, gosh, you're pretty good. I think you ought to just put the code in directly. And they have a little committer vote, you know, and uh, uh, typically by email. And, uh, and if everybody else agrees, you know, look over what the guy's done, uh, say, okay, you can be a committer. That's, uh, they call that the meritocracy. Uh, what's interesting in the Eclipse Foundation is that is completely independent of the membership of the foundation. That anybody, you could all be without any further ado, could become Eclipse committers by just doing hard work and having merit. Uh, another thing is the tradition in open source is, uh, is very much about uh, serving the developers. You know, the developers were writing open source for other developers. You know, that's who they knew. They, uh, you know, it, it, it started as a grassroots movement. And I think that this is one area where the Eclipse Foundation is, is uh, trying to rewrite the rules a little bit. We want to be a little more like Agile in that we want to, uh, to use the power of open source, but to, uh, to serve a larger community than just developers. Uh, you know, it used to be that if you had a sound card and it didn't work with Linux, you'd go hack the drivers until it worked and that was your contribution. But now we want to focus this power of open source on problems that are a little bigger, probably problems of the scale that, uh, that you folks have. And I think that's part of the evolution. Every time somebody says, well, we should just pull together a little community and do this X, Y, Z in open source, you know, what, uh, what's important that they understand how to, uh, to motivate community, how to organize, how to govern, and so forth. I wish I could put a fourth column up there that says, here's how to do it in the uh, government sector, and uh, I don't actually know how to do it in the government sector. I have some ideas, but I thought what I'd do is uh, finish our time this morning, or this afternoon here, by letting you help me finish this talk. What we're gonna do is form a little community uh, what I want to do is prime the pump a little bit by asking you to just take one minute and to think to yourself, just think quietly, close your eyes if it helps, think about what issues I've talked about, about community, would resonate in your organization or would be resisted in your organization. How would it work? How could you work with people in similar organizations in other states or countries? So one minute, just think about that. And, and if you have a piece of paper, jot down a note or two. Uh, you don't have to turn it in, but just I want you to remember what you thought about. It's a long time. We're only halfway through, but really, I want you to honestly try hard. This is this is the uh, participation part. Get back to thinking. Now, you don't have to stop thinking just because I'm talking again, but what we're going to do is I would like some volunteers to come up, and what we're going to do is have a little community here on the stage, and we're going to discuss your issues about the kind of stuff that I've been talking about here on the stage. And we have one rule, and that is we're going to leave one chair empty. So I'd like uh, to bring a, a, what will be myself, and I need four volunteers, and uh, if you're watching us discuss something and you look down at the piece of paper where you wrote your notes and you say, you know, they haven't talked about that yet, I want you to just walk up here. There's a little stairway over here. Just come up and take this seat that's empty. And somebody will figure out that they're done and get up and go back and sit down. So we're going to see if this works. Uh, I really want your participation. In case you're a little afraid, I've asked that they turn off the video so nobody will see you doing this being silly. We still will have an audio track, so if you want to tell your friends all the great stuff that went on, there'll be audio. 
I did ask a couple of people to, uh, to help me. Uh, one is Richard down here who's really helped organize this conference and, and understands a lot about uh, uh, both business and government that I don't, and I know that he can help. Uh, and, and we have Skip who helped, uh, I don't see Skip. Skip, wave your hand. Uh, maybe he'll come up here if we really need him. Uh, and he's the guy who helped put the Eclipse Foundation together in the first place. And uh, so we have some heavies here, but mostly I really want you to come up and give this a try. And, uh, and let's see if we can't make this relate to your needs.